Test, test. Good morning, sisters and brothers. Peace be with you. Um, wow, it's, do I sound pretty loud? I kind of hear the echo. <laughs> okay. Um, feels better? Oh, yeah, better. Do you know what day is it tomorrow? It's a holiday, yes. It's the Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Do you, do you have a, we're going to have a day off? Yeah. Who's, who will have a, a day off tomorrow? Oh, nice, nice. Cool, I think most of the schools are, yeah, closed, right? Um, it's been raining like almost a whole week um, last week, well, um, the past week, so when I realized that it's a long weekend, I kind of figured that it's not possible for me to make any plans already. Um, and my father, um, Yosef's grandpa, is actually coming to visit next week. So I guess tomorrow will be a cleaning day <laughs> for my apartment. <clears throat> um, I didn't grow up here in America, so I don't really know how um, MLK, Martin Luther King Jr., is taught in school here, but I believe his. Well, everyone knows um, his famous I Have a Dream speech, um, as well as the, um, the boycott and nonviolent civil rights um, movement he led. Um, the first time I learned about Martin Luther King is um, in my high school time back in Japan, actually. My English teacher, Goto Sensei, um, he was very creative in making and developing the curriculums, especially with the teaching materials he used um, in the class. So Goto Sensei um, is very into these um, topics of social justice and international politics. So he would come up to me and ask, oh, how uh, the Taiwanese people perceive um, the colonial era, like under Japanese rule, or even the political situation between Taiwan and China. And it took me a while um, for my Japanese to get to that level when I could explain and articulate my thoughts on those topics better. But now looking back, um, I really appreciate how he approached um, to me with those questions so I could find out what had happened in the past to my homeland. Um, so in one of the English classes, Goto Sensei um, used um, this, the speech, I have a dream, as a text um, for us to study. So, um, to be honest, I didn't understand that much of the contents besides the frequently repeated, I have a dream. And this is um, the best quote I love from um, the speech. But Goto Sensei let us listen to the recording of this speech as well. So, um, Martin Luther King's voice actually echoing my head with a very, very strong impression. At Fuller Seminary, I had a chance to take um, a class called The Theology and Ethics of Martin Luther King Jr. It is one of the signature um, courses to take at Fuller, and in this course I had an opportunity to get to know Martin Luther King at a more personal level um, in depth by reading his articles 
and listening to his speeches and sermons. I was able to learn about his upbringing, education, um, ministries, as well as his theology and the civil rights um, movement he got involved. Through MLK's whole life, I found that the legacy he left to this country is how he stood against the social injustice and fought for the human rights of African Americans with all the non-violent civil rights uh, movement. But after all the studying the course, I realized that a message I was able to learn through his life is pretty much to love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. Knowing that some people in our community in this country still face racism, social inequality, and even oppression simply because of their appearances, family backgrounds, or social economic um, status. How can we truly love our neighbor if we neglect all these unrighteous things and allow them to happen day after day? Love your neighbor is definitely a challenging topic to address today while experiencing these conscious or unconscious isolation and separation. So when I was pondering on um, how the life of MLK had contributed to America's social justice, I was urged to use Love Your Neighbor for um, the message today. So yeah, let's just jump into uh, the passage um, today from Luke 10, 25 to 37, and we'll read it all together. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord of God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. <clears throat> so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, he stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse for your every expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. This is the word of God. This is a conversation between Jesus and an expert in the law. Some other translations um, would say a lawyer or scribes. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the background of the gospel of Luke today, but just to focus on this parable of the Good Samaritan. The expert Sorry. <clears throat> this expert in the law asked Jesus, how can he inherit eternal life? That is a lot of um, Jewish people, um, that's something a lot of Jewish people concerned with about this eternal life. They try to obey the Jewish law for their whole life so they can believe, they, they believe that if they could live a sinless life, they will be able to enter the kingdom of heaven to enjoy eternal life with the Lord. 
And because this expert in the law knows the law so well, when Jesus asked him, what's written in the law? He answered immediately, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus' response was, well, you know the answer, so just do it. This implies that the expert in the law probably wasn't doing what he was saying. For many things, even we have the knowledge or we know what we're supposed to do, we don't really do it. For example, we know yeah, what to eat and what not to eat so we can be healthier, but we rather choose what tastes more yummy. It's just that you know, we know it, we say it, but we don't really do it. I said in my message before, Jesus is a doer, not a talker. So he told this expert that if you know what's written in the law, just do it. Then this expert in the law wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? He wanted a definition of neighbor from Jesus because even though it says, love your neighbor as yourself in the Jewish law, there might be different interpretations of who the neighbor is. I think this expert in the law was pretty confident that he loved God with all his heart, all his soul, and all his strength, and all his mind, because he had no questions about that part um, for Jesus. Like some Christians who are yeah, more legalistic today, they make sure they live a Christian life by fulfilling everything a good Christian is supposed to do. They go to church every Sunday for the worship service. They serve at church for various roles in the ministry. They pray and read the Bible every day. And they faithfully tithe and offer their earnings for the ministry of God. But like what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, if we do all the things but do not love, all of them are in vain. Also like the priest and the Levite, this expert in the law probably loved those lovable ones in his own or their own communities because, um, but they didn't really love those who um, were with leprosy, the, the skin disease, the text collectors and others who um, they consider as sinners. So this expert tried to justify himself by saying, okay, tell me who my neighbor is so I can make excuse um, to tell you why there are some people I can't love because of this separation in the Jewish um, community. Therefore, Jesus gave this parable of the Good Samaritan that is for the purpose of revealing who our neighbor is and how shall we love them. I believe a lot of us have heard this parable of the Good Samaritan um, because it's such a, well, it's a very, very popular story that, you know, Sunday school teachers or parents um, would always use it to tell their students and children how they should show kindness and love to, um, to people. Maybe in, like, yeah, CM, the children ministry, you've heard this story many, many times, and I know in, in like VVS or Christian camps or retreat, this story is often, often used for like skit. So, well, when I was a kid, I really wanted to be one of the robbers. So, you know, I can kind of just, yeah, do something um, that I can justify. Well, but what did you see and what did you learn? from this parable. Um, in this parable, I have three points, or, or three insights to share with you all today. Um, the first, love requires awareness. Love requires awareness. And the second one is, love requires change. And the last one is, love requires action. I'll go through um, these three points real quick today, and yeah, hopefully we can share um, this insight a little bit. After reading this passage, 
Do you see what is going on um, in, in the parable? This man was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. And it's actually only about 23 miles, um, straight line distance, you know, when you turn on your Google um, like map navigation. Sometimes it shows you, oh, it's straight line distance. And then once you click like navigate, and then, oh, how come there's like longer distance you need to go? Because, yeah, there's one year roads on the way. But can you see um, where Jerusalem and Jericho is? There are with green dots. So um, Jericho is right by the, the Dead Sea. So, yeah, it's pretty, um, it's not too far. But if you just see on this map, you can't really tell um, the elevation between two these two cities. Because if we use this um, satellite uh, map, can you tell that Jerusalem is actually in a higher ground? And going to Jericho is going down. Because Jesus said this um, man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho because, yeah, there is, um, I think, 3,000 feet elevation. This, um, the, the resolution is not very good, but from Jericho to Jerusalem, it's about like 3,000 feet elevation in a very short distance, like 23 miles. So it's a very, very whiny and... Yeah, a very difficult hike if you're going all the way up. And this is uh, one of the pictures they took like from um, the side from Jerusalem to Jericho. So this is nothing there pretty much actually. And when this man got mugged and beaten up by the robbers on the way, he was pretty much in the midst of nowhere and half that just in this place. Can you imagine? You're left like a long in this kind of place, and probably it's already getting dark, and no one's passing by, but there is one person who passed by. Who was the first one? Do you remember? We just read it. <laughs> it's a priest. It's a priest who passed by. And did he see this man? Yes, yes, but what did he do? He passed by on the other side. He didn't even get close to that person. I remember in the skit I played um, when I was in like children's Sunday school, the, the priest made an excuse saying, oh, I'm on my way to give sacrifice offering to God, so I have to stay holy, um, not touching any dead body or blood, so I can't really help this person and I just got to keep going so I don't miss the appointment. But when I read this parable again carefully, it was interesting that this priest was actually going down the same road with this traveler from Jerusalem to Jericho. That means he should have finished his job um, giving sacrifice offerings in, in Jerusalem and probably he's on his way home or going to Jericho for other purpose. Um, so. There should be an, yeah, there shouldn't be an excuse and say, I can't touch blood or dead body if, yeah, he was willing to help this man. And then, who was the second person passed by? Yes, a Levite. I think in this picture, he's probably the guy in the back, yeah, with red clock on. And did he see this man? Yes, yes, he did. But, but what did he do? He also just passed by on the other side. The status of a Levite um, is not as high as the priest in the Jewish tradition, but they are also trained to be um, leaders to perform like um, religious rituals like the sacraments. Unfortunately, this Levite didn't reach out his hand to help this half-dead man either and just walked by. It is understandable um, that if, you know, it were you and me passing by someone who got beaten up really bad, bleeding on the roadside, we would be hesitant to help, especially, you know, yeah, 
we, if we saw someone like that at a place um, between Jerusalem and Jericho in the picture we saw like in the wilderness. But who is the third person who passed by? The Samaritan. Did he see this person, this man? Yes, and what did he do? He saw him and took pity on him. In Jesus' time, even though the Samaritans lived on the land where the kingdom of Israel used to stand, they were considered the offspring of the local Israelites and Gentiles after the northern kingdom um, was destroyed by Assyrian. There are also some more historical backgrounds on um, why some Jewish um, people who consider themselves like more pure um, wouldn't have interaction with the um, Samaritans. But this kind of racial segregation was one of the reasons. If you read John 4, um, the conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman by the well, um, you, yeah, you can probably see some ideas why their relationship was so awkward. But ironically, this Samaritan not only saw this man who was half dead, he also saw his wounds and knew that if he doesn't do something, if he doesn't do anything, this man is going to die. He was aware. He was aware of the importance to save someone's life, no matter what ethnicity that person is or what kind of history they had in the past. He was aware that this man needed help because it was obvious that he was dying. He was also aware that life is more precious than his own business, so he made it the priority to go and bandage the wounded man and even used his own donkey to bring him to an inn and took care of him. The priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, they all saw this wounded man but only the Samaritan had awareness of the need of him. Do you see people around being wounded sometimes as well? At school, um, some in the class might be bullied because they are, um, I, mean, I mean, others in the class think they are weird or, or dumb or just not cool. Some might be getting laughed at or ignored because they don't speak English very well for their family just moved to the States. Some people might be struggling um, with their work, but no one in the office is willing to help. We probably see the issues and problems in, in those people, but are we aware that they need help? Love requires awareness because if we only see what is happening, but not aware of the deeper needs of people in their situations, I don't know whether we can say we love our neighbor. If you are on track with um, the daily devotional schedule on our bulletin, um, or the Living Life Cena, um, I Love Jesus, you should have read in Mark 6 um, this Wednesday, I think, yeah, it's verse 34 saying, Jesus saw a large crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Jesus saw the crowd and found out that they were lost and they needed a shepherd. So he showed his love by teaching them and giving them directions of life. For us, I believe it is so important to think about how we can be more aware of others' needs. Let us try not only to see what we see or what we need, but start to be aware of the need of others. Being aware of the need of others is only the first step because love also requires change. When Jesus asked the expert um, in the law, um, which of the three, um, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, do you see, uh, do you think, was the neighbor to this man who fell into the hand of the robber, um, the man? The answer from the expert was the one who had mercy on him. 
I actually found this answer kind of bitter because he didn't say, oh, it's the priest, it's the Levite or the Samaritan, but the one who had mercy on him. It was probably hard for the expert in the law to admit that he might not even consider the Samaritan as his neighbor because of the discrimination and segregation um, they had towards the Samaritan. But he did touch a point that the Samaritan had mercy on this wounded man. Again, the priest and the Levite did see the dying man, but they had no mercy on him. Love requires change because most of the time people do not mind, I mean, people do only mind their business and do not really pay attention on others' matters. Having awareness um, is the first step, as I said, and the second step is to change our heart. The priest and the Levite are like people with a heart of stone. They didn't show any mercy or feel pity for the man who got robbed. They were so focused on what they were planning to do. Um, they rushed their way to their direction, uh, destination without stopping, and they avoided the man to take the other side of the road. They cared more about their own safety and decided to let the man die, pretty much. But to be honest, it is not an easy task for anyone to change. Even though God created us and gave us this life, we all grew up in different families and different environments. We might share some similarities in values and cultures because of our family backgrounds or traditions, but we are also formed differently in our family of origin with the heritage our parents or our grandparents passed on to us consciously and unconsciously. Some people might be blessed with a more peaceful or rational parenting, some people might have struggled in more of a dysfunctional family. We'd like to change in a good way, but this change is such a challenging task. Those who go to like Chinese school, can you read this? <laughs> Jason, can you read it? Oh, Jiang Shan Yi Gai, Ben Xing Nan Yi. Yeah, literally it means rivers are, and mountains are easy to change. Man's character is much harder. And well, in the English parable, it's like the, what, the leper cannot change its spots, which means, oops. You can't change who you are. You can't change who you are. So when we are stuck with certain habits or having a tendency to react and, um, to things and respond to others when our emotions are triggered, it is just not easy to say, oh, I can change to a different person right away. Especially for those who are close to you, your siblings, your children, family members, they know you so well and they know where your bottom is. They might keep like pushing your button um, with the way they usually treat you because they know how you would react. We are not able to change by ourselves, but if we keep praying to God, God would use the environment and the people around you or sometimes some trials and, and tests to let you experience this kind of change. And the good news is this change is also a promise from God. In Ezekiel, um, even when the Israelites were captured in Babylon with despair, God made Ezekiel to give this prophecy twice, twice. Um, the first one is in Ezekiel chapter 11. God said, I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. And the other one is in Ezekiel 36. It says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And the truth is, if we do not change, 
we are not able to love. Because there are people around us who are not lovable at all. It's, it's easy to love those who are lovable and kind and friendly because they don't offend you, they don't hurt you, they don't say anything against you. But unfortunately, those are not the only people God told us to love. Jesus wants us to love our neighbor, including our enemies. In Matthew um, 5, 44, 45, he says, Love your enemies and pray for those who perse persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. It is a cha challenge to step out from our comfort zone, our small circle where it keeps us safe but away from growing. No one likes to change if it comes with a cost, and no one can truly change by their own effort. Only the Holy Spirit can do the, the job to change us, to transform us. We can't expect someone who's been smoking for decades to say, oh, I'll quit smoking today, right now, by that person's own will or strength. Only if we invite Holy Spirit into our lives with prayers, a heart of stone can be replaced by a heart of flesh, and it is a new heart with a new spirit in us. Lastly, I would like to let you know love also requires action. I will use two verses from the Bible to support this point. First one from 1 John, uh, 1 John um, chapter 3, 18 says, Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. What John's trying to say is very obvious. He, he wants us not only to talk about love, but to do things with love and practice how we love in action. Because, you know, Bible also tells us, whatever you do for the one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. The Samaritan didn't even know the man who was robbed. He saw him, took pity on him, and then took action. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Not only that, he also put the man on his donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. And not only that, the next day he took out two denarii that are worth the wage of two full day labor at the time and gave them to the innkeeper. He even promised to return and reimburse all extra expenses. This is how the Samaritan showed his love through actions. This is exactly what Jesus told the expert in the law to do. Just two things. Jesus said, do this and you will live. Jesus said, go and do likewise. In the very end of um, today's message, I would like to share a video clip with you. I'm not gonna say um, much before showing this to you because I don't wanna spoil it, but I just wanna let you know, I do understand that you might act differently due to various situations but please, please, do think of what love your neighbor means to you, as well as in God's eyes. What would, you, what would be your action when you see someone in need? Will you be aware of their needs? Will you change your attitude or mindset? Will you take an action to do something? Let us watch this video all together.
the closer the person is to us and the less common the struggle, the easier it is to love. God forbid I find out my wife has three months to live. I quit my job, I quit everything, right? What if it's just an acquaintance of yours? And what if the problem's recurring? The more common and further from us, how common is homelessness? And how frequently is the homeless person someone dear to us personally? Never. So I took a few moments a couple of weeks ago and camped outside of a couple of our campuses and I wanted to see how we were doing, you know, when it's hardest to love. Do you know that your Father in heaven is giving the same graces to the person that's hardest for you to love? He's giving it. He's giving. He doesn't play favors. He's giving the grace to everyone. And if we're going to love like our Father in heaven loves, we don't get to play favorites. And by favorites, I mean so often we love the people where there's some benefit in it for us, right? Okay, 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 fine. I'll call my brother when I get home. I haven't talked to him for two years, but I'll call him. Really, will you, will you? Because that's going to work out pretty good for you, right? Now everything's going to be good with your brother. Your mom will get off your back, and your sister's not going to think you're a jerk anymore. And, and I mean, this is, but see, that's not what I'm talking about. Yes, do that. But not just that. Where it's not your favorite, where there's nothing in it for you, where it's not an upgrade to your portfolio of awesomeness. So how did our church do in the video? I'm going to tell you now. awesome. I, I was crying inside that beard. I cannot believe the people in this church. The number of people that prayed with me and brought me food. Just watch and see. something to eat this morning. Here's a coffee. A coffee to keep you warm. Let's just pray for you real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, so thankful, Lord, that you brought this man to your church on your day, Lord. We are so blessed that he is here. Lord, we just pray more into this man and just bless him and love him. Well, God, I just pray that you would just meet this man and, Father, that if it would be your will, that you would just have um, him come into our church, but that you just know the love of Christ. I don't want you to be out here without knowing him, okay? You're welcome to come inside. We'd love to have you. You All can right. come in if you want. <laughs> That's all right. Bye. How you doing tonight? Doing okay? Do you like to come in and have church with us? And sit with us for church? Is there like people we pray for you or is it like... but I got some water for you. And uh, something more valuable. It's the word of God here. And God bless you. Is there anything I can be praying for for you, sir? Can I pray for you? Here. Uh, thank you, Father, for this morning. Thank you for this beautiful day, and thank you for my friend here. I just pray that you be with him today. Uh, give him everything he needs. Provide for him. God, you are our provider. You love us, you care for us, and you love this man right here.
Let us bow our head and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us and gave, gave your one and only Son to this world to die for our sins. When we try to obey your commitment to love our neighbor, Lord, help us not only to see what is going around around us, but also make us aware of the need of others, the unrighteous things that are still happening. Change our heart, O oh Lord, so that we do not stay as who we are today, but we'll be able to grow each and every day with a new heart and a new spirit that you had promised to us. Lord, move us to put our words and thought into actions so we can truly love our neighbor. Thank you, Lord, and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now it is the time um, for us to worship in tithing and offering. It is the time we give um, a portion of what God has provided for us back to Him for, for His ministry. It is a time to remember what we have. It's all from God because we came to this world with nothing in our hands and as we leave this world, we carry nothing away. God's blessings are abundant for those who are faithful in giving with a grateful heart. And for those who are not working or not having any income, I would like to encourage you to think about how you can offer your time, your prayer and your service and your dedication to God's ministry. Yeah. Please. stand and sing, King of my heart, and as we sing, may it be a prayer that God would truly be the King of our hearts to be able to love everyone around us.
good. You are good. up his countenance upon you. May the Lord make you aware of the need of others. May the Lord change your heart, urge you to love in action, and give you peace.